so the coastal zone is this really cool place. Um, for the purposes, well, let me ask you guys, what do you guys call the coastal zone? When I say coastal, what do you guys think of? Beach. Beach, okay, cool. Seven miles in. Okay, okay, a certain linear distance in, so from the, say, coast, from the beach, let's say, inland. Okay, cool. And out. Okay, and out maybe. Okay, so a certain distance inward from the coastline, a certain distance outward from the coastline. Good. What else? Or anything else? What was that? Okay, so okay, so so roads, infrastructure right there on or near the coast. Weather. Okay. Okay. So so rainfall, fog, that kind of stuff that might be um, particularly different next to the the coastline versus somewhere else. Okay, cool. Anything else? Okay, so subtitle ecology stuff, so more marine stuff that's near the coast. Cool. People, definitely people. People are always the big problem. <laughs> the, the cool thing and the problem thing, all wrapped in, all wrapped in one. Absolutely. So, you know, all these, all these classes we have, you guys, conservation biology, uh, you know, land use, all this stuff. It's really about people, right? It's really about dealing with the people. Um, the, the, the natural, re the, the, the life, the erosion, the, that stuff is, is usually a not that big a deal in terms of uh, solving problems. It's usually the people that make uh, a lot of our challenges. So we, we manage people. We, even though we, say, we talk about natural resource management, which is sort of a totally male-dominated phrase, but in any event, um, and, and the implication is often that we're going to manage the grass. We're going to do something to the grass. We're going to do something to the river. But in reality, most of our time is spent doing things to the people, creating rules, creating procedures, uh, how we behave with those resources is really what we're, we're manipulating, managing. Cool. Anything else? Any other ideas about coastal? So those are all good. Uh, I would say those are all, thanks, Steve. Those are all valid. Um, for the purposes of our class, we have a, we're going to have a broad conceptualization of the coast. So we're going to talk about any part of the land that's going to directly influence the marine environment. And similarly, any uh, 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 parts of the marine environment that are going to have a direct impact, tangible impact on the land. So for practical purposes, we could say something like 10 miles in, 50 miles in. We could use a, use a linear distance. And sometimes that's the approach. And I have some readings for you guys uh, on this. But, but um, sometimes that's the appropriate thing. Maybe we're doing a GIS and it's just, you know, it's easier if we have a nice clear strip of the coast to just use that really crisp metric. Conceptually though, we're talking more, if we're talking the land side, more about watersheds. So, you know, the, our side of the Sierra Nevada could be coastal in that definition, right? Because the rainfall it's gonna hit, hit on those slopes is gonna go down, maybe it's gonna go in the Sacramento River, and the Sacramento River is gonna go to the San Francisco Bay Delta, the San Francisco Bay Delta is gonna go in the ocean, so like that. Um, and similarly, we get all kinds of weather, um, particles, all kinds of stuff, fish that might start out or, or spend part of their life in the ocean, maybe 50 miles off, maybe 100 miles off. And, and those guys are going to maybe come on to, say, the San Francisco Bay Estuary and then go up the Sacramento River, et cetera. So, so in practical purposes, it could be hundreds of miles from the actual coastline. Um, is one totally legitimate definition of the coastal zone. But for most of our class, we're going to keep that at the conceptual level. If we're talking about water, then totally, of course, that makes sense. Um, if we're talking about uh, marine debris, maybe that also totally makes sense. But if we're talking about something more like uh, economic input, right, so, so how much money, we're, or how much revenue the coastal cities are getting or coastal counties, whatever, maybe we'll use a more, a tighter definition. Maybe we'll use counties that touch the coast. Right, coastal counties, for example, and so forth. Um, so uh, I would just say the definition of the coast is a good one to keep in the back of your mind because different people will use different definitions. Some will use that linear distance. Some will say within five miles, 10 miles, 50 miles of the coast. Other people will say um, much shorter distances um, and, and so forth. The, the biggest issue though for us with coastal the most important thing that will always apply in any context that we talk about, or virtually any context, is coastal for us means the land 
and the ocean. It's both, it's all the, and the air, it's all that whole system. Oftentimes when we talk about this stuff, people think of only the offshore stuff or only the, the near shore land terrestrial stuff. And really these are a coupled systems. It's a coupled system. So we might focus on one or two areas here and there, but really overall we're interested in this entire integrated thing. Cool? All right. Uh, the other thing to say is that we're in a very unusual time, certainly the most unusual time in my life in terms of coastal zone management because of some of the forces uh, that are at work in our country and actually across the globe. One is the climate change issue and all, all that, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's sort of been going on. It's getting more intense and everything. That's been going on for a while. But, but really, it's more the political structures that, are, that seem to be changing. And so, uh, and so they're making management a, a harder to predict thing. <laughs> it's unclear uh, if we're going to have the same rules this year as next year and the year before. And that really is a fundamental thing because if the rules are constantly changing, it's hard to manage, right? If you don't know what your budget is every week, it's hard to buy the right amount of food because you don't know if you're going to go over budget or, or what have you. So just a couple examples of this, this interesting world that we're in. There's a lot of rhetoric now that, that is, is being sparked, um, principally by um, the folks in the executive branch uh, in, in the, at the federal level, the federal government, that are, are, seem really um, hell-bent on changing the rules, changing how things uh, progress. And so this is uh, often portrayed as a, a so-called war on the environment, very, very kind of aggressive thing. Um, but there's, uh, it, is a, it is a crazy time. It is a crazy time right now. More, a couple examples in a second. But it's interesting that the coast and coastal rhetoric are one of the most common ways that we communicate. Whatever our political beliefs, whatever the particular issue, things like sinking of ships, that, that's a cultural thing, right? And you could use that in a debate in Idaho or in Hawaii or whatever, and everybody seems to get that imagery. Everybody seems to understand that. In this case, this is um, talking about the fact that, for example, um, yesterday or two days ago, our Secretary of State just announced that we we're, were eliminating the special envoys to deal with uh, climate change in the Arctic. And one of the key issues there is the fact that, for example, Russia has nine new icebreakers coming online. We've had one that we've been asking for for years and years, and it keeps getting cut from the budget. And, and that's what this is showing, that, that the budget has most recently been, been axed so that we would not have a, a new icebreaker. I think our oldest icebreaker, our newest icebreaker is like 30 years old or something, so old tech. So all kinds of consequences when we talk about management, we talk about fishermen's safety, we talk about the ability to get to oil rigs that might be leaking oil in the Arctic and stuff like that. So um, an ability to, to manage issues is, is harmed when we don't have the emergency response equipment, for example, to, to deal with it. So that, that's a current debate, um, federal government. Um, and, and again, so this is about wetlands, right? And so we hear this a lot. Uh, uh, our current president talks about draining the swamp as if swamps are evil. I love swamps. I work in swamps. If you guys come with us to New Orleans this year, you'll work in swamps, right? So they're cool things. It's strange that we have this negative associate. It's not strange. I know why, but, but um, that's a very old way of thinking about this important coastal resource, estuaries, wetlands, swamps, all these things. They're actually one of the most productive. Actually, they're the most productive natural ecosystem that we have. Sugarcane is more productive on a, on a square, you know, sort of artificial um, artificial inputs with fertilizer and stuff, but just on their own, wetlands are incredibly productive systems. They're fantastic cleaners of water, et cetera. So the notion that there's some horrible thing that we should drain and destroy is interesting. And, and the fact that that has also entered the lexicon is also interesting. Again, um, we, the coastal zone is the metaphor people go to, even when it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the coast. So again, this is, this is another recent political cartoon about uh, getting rid of some of the folks in the current administration or having them uh, be released or fired. Um, and the notion of, uh, again, we might not know what the exact story is, but everybody kind of gets the idea of a grounded ship, right? A, a, a ship that's stranded um, on a forlorn beach. Um, it'll, it'll, it's an interesting time for me to teach you about coastal management because, again, the rules seem to be changing. So one of the rules that just was deleted um, in the last a few weeks is our Secretary of the, of the Interior just deleted the rule that banned, or that 
that um, we've been working on for a long time that had been in place to essentially um, de-emphasize the use of gill nets. These are a non-selective fishing methodology that uses these nets that you see here. And uh, they're, very, I mean, they're very effective in terms of catching fish. So the idea here is there are these, these uh, mesh boxes, if you will, mesh diamonds. And fish are kind of woo -woo, swimming around. They're, they're usually made out of monofilament or very thin rope. Typically these days monofilament, so really hard to see. And the fish is swim, 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 swim. If he's a little fish, he'll go right through and keep going and no, no big deal. But if he's, and if he's a huge fish, he'll bump into it and go the other way. But if he's just about the right size range, he's going to bump into that and keep swimming forward because he's a fish, right? And so, and then the net's going to go over his head and then go to the sort of, you know, upper part of his head and he'll get stuck. And he's like, what? This sucks. And he'll try to back up because most fish have, um, have gill covers, these opercula. Um, when, when they try to pull back, those guys, they get stuck. So it's sort of like a one way, almost like an arrow getting stuck in there. And so these are very, very effective fishing tools. They're, they're great for catching a lot of fish. The problem is most of the fish that we catch them, we don't want and we don't need. So we cause a lot of unneeded death. And with the term for that, we'll get to this later in this message, the term for that is bycatch. So these are really notorious systems. And, and these also are not um, typically anchored. These are drift. Not only did, <laughs> this isn't just gill nets, these, these are drift gill nets. These are kinds that you let float. These are kinds that are very, very easy to lose track of and then just go floating off in the ocean and kill. And they can kill for years and years and years. So these are some shots of sharks and, and tuna and other things that are, that are killed. Um, and mola mola, big giant um, uh, Pacific sunfish there on the right, um, from th these policies. So most of us have looked at these policies and said these policies are bad, or, or this management issue, this way of fishing is not good by and large. Let's do something different. But again, not everyone is in agreement. Some people apparently like this. And this leads to this whole so called ghost fishing cycle where these, these, these fishing nets can float all the way across the Pacific at times and keep killing for years and years and years and take potentially large things like whales and stuff as well. So what did Zinke do the other day? He... Uh, this wasn't the other day, this, this, was, this was over the summer, but basically we had an executive order that, that banned, that, that didn't allow people to use Not this really. fishing. Mm -hmm. so, so two thirds of the actions so far that uh, uh, Zinke has uh, changed um, deal with environmental protection. So, and they've mostly been deleting existing rules. So, um, so we have stuff like that. We have all kinds of political issues in the coastal zone, the broadly defined coastal zone. So this is one that's increasingly becoming a hot button issue. This is the South China Sea. And, the, uh, and, and essentially what we're dealing with is a, is a China on the rise, a growing power, right? China is getting its sea legs. It, it is not coming to the world state, stage, it is returning to the world stage, where it had been for a long time, that for the past several hundred years it, it has been unusually absent. It's, it's returning to its uh, dominance, as you would expect, from a country that large with a culture that diverse and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and so, in this case, they've decided that these islands in the South China Sea, so to the, to the south and, and west of, of most of China, that this is theirs. This is their place. And so, you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law, so this is what they're basically doing. So they've gone in, in some cases, they've gone into places that weren't an island. In most of the other cases, they've gone to an area that was a little teeny sand spit, a little coral atoll, and started massively dredging sucking up sand from the bottom, just like we do here when we need to nourish our beaches in Wainimi or what have you. But in this case, they have sensitive coral, diverse ecosystems, et cetera, and they just blow the hell out of them. So they, they, they sediment in these areas, and so they create essentially dry land where there wasn't dry land, and then they build military bases, and then they say, this is our territory. An age-old thing, we did this in, everybody did this in Antarctica for a long time. Um, this is what the colonial powers used to do. It's just crazy this is happening right now when these areas are recognized by most of the world as being owned by the Philippines or Taiwan or something like that. And so a hugely uh, important issue that has to do with management, in this case literally making, making land where there wasn't land, and then the implications of that for fishing policy, for national security policy, for free movement of the sea, for energy movement through the sea, all kinds of stuff like that. 
So that's a that falls in the realm of coastal zone management and how do we deal with this stuff. We have all kinds of things that uh, are of concern. Um, you might have seen uh, some news stories in the last few months uh, that, that emanated from a paper in March by um, a bunch of coral reef biologists that basically sounded the warning bell in over what appears to be the loss of the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest biogenic structure on Earth that you can see from space. So um, we can see forests, but the forests that we see are really, you know, there's a tree, and there's another tree, another tree, and grassland, all that good stuff. But um, these large structures here are all secreted by, or they're, they're, they're secreted chalk by these cnidarians. And so the Great Barrier Reef is one of the great wonders of the world, and we are doing pretty much everything we can do to destroy that thing. And so as, as one small example, this is one reef, pictures from December 2014, February 2015, and August 2015. So it's healthy on the left. That th those are live, vibrant, living coral, uh, uh, staghorn uh, coral heads. Um, they've bleached, which means the zooxanthellae, the, the symbiont that, they've, that they have inside of them, the algae that they've captured and they've imprisoned in their tissues, that photosynthesizes, that, that hits the sunlight and then le leaks sugars, leaches sugars out, and the coral animals, the polyps, get that as food. Uh, something goes awry. We're not, we, we don't fully, fully understand uh, all the possible mechanisms, but um, it has to do with a warming water temperature, it has to do with various things. But climate change, sea level temperature rise in particular is, is, is highly related to this. Also, ocean acidification has some stuff to do with it and other things. But the point is, um, the coral freak out and they, they barf out their, their symbionts. They throw them out the side of their body. So when it first happens, the coral is not dead, but they immediately look white, hence the term coral bleaching. It looks like we took that, that piece and stuck it in a bucket of bleach for five minutes and then pulled it out and it's you know, nice, pretty bright white. So they're not dead right there in the middle picture, but they're well on their way. Some coral can recover. After they barf out those guys, some of them can suck new guys in and, and, and recover and, and keep going. But the vast majority of the time, that does not happen. And so then on the right, it looks like, oh, stuff's all better. Actually, what you're seeing there are filamentous algae that have come in and colonized the reef. And so now they're, they're, they're covering that skeleton. So visually, at first it might look okay, but that's all dead and dying. And over the course of the next several weeks, several months, several years, as the waves hit these pieces of coral and break them, there's no more living coral to make new coral. Whereas if it was healthy and a storm came in and broke some, broke some parts of the coral, those individuals would, would continue to grow and they'd secrete and over time they'd recover that, that physical system of the, of the architecture of the reef and that is not happening. So, so the, this paper uh, basically said that last year we were in the third major global scale. In other words, not just in happening in one location, one country, one area, but happening across the entirety of the globe simultaneously, or at least the vast majority of the globe. And, and this is the third one since we really started observing these things in the 1980s. And they almost always lead to degraded reefs, lower biodiversity, less fish for local folks to, to eat and catch, and all the kind of downside things that come with that. And their prediction was the Great Barrier Reef, as we know it, might be gone by 2050. So that's a huge concern in terms of management. We want to make sure our biological resources don't disappear. Um, then we have issues like the built environment. So this is uh, Venice, Italy. This is a, a, shot, a screenshot from um, Google Earth. And these are the so-called Mohs Gates. These are, so Venice has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Longer than that. And an important cultural mecca, uh, helped birth the modern, modern uh, you know, capitalist economy and trading economies in the Mediterranean, all that stuff. Um, and Venice was built in a, essentially in a lagoon in a wetland. And people oftentimes mischaracterize this as thinking that Venice is sinking. Venice isn't really sinking. It's that the ocean waters around Venice are rising. And Venice was built always, for its whole history, it's always had issues of flooding. It's been very, very, very low, very, very close to the, to the level of the ocean. And so with even just a moderate amount of sea level rise, they have lots of problems. So in this case, which we increasingly hear about this in our country, and this is one of the major things that Dr. Patch and 
Dr. Patch and I were on a phone call just earlier today talking about, about some of these issues. But this notion of how do we solve this? And one of the default issues is build more crap, build more stuff, right? And so in this case, the build more stuff is a gate, is a, is a, a, a literal water barrier that at, at times of high tide or a big storm is coming in, something of that nature, we would close off the mouth of this, this lagoon, estuary, gulf place, and then prevent the city from flooding. This is a major deal. So this, the city floods frequently now. And so these are people, wa you know, now one of the biggest businesses to have if you're in Venice is to sell galoshes, to sell, you know, waiter, because everything is wet. One of my friends, um, his family, he's from Italy. They have uh, a house that his family has owned for like 300 years or something like that. And uh, it's a huge cost to maintain it because the first floor is almost always wet, damp now. And how do you, how do you, you know, keep a several story building alive when the foundation is constantly rotting, for example. Um, but, uh, but so there's those issues. And as we'll see with the coastal zone, it is virtually never a thing. It is a thing plus another thing plus another thing, plus another thing, because the, everybody loves the coast. Everybody wants to be here. Fishermen want to be here. Manufacturing wants to be here. The, the, the people that want you to rent their hotel want you to be here. You and I are here, right? All that stuff. And so, so on top of the regular stuff about the problem of Venice flooding and, and, and urban cities on the coast being threatened with floods, we also have this notion of way too many people. So now the big issue with Venice is there's so many tourists that go to Venice. The, the, the native residents, the, the, the local Venetians, they're basically leaving because they, they try to go outside and they're saying, holy cow, I can't even get to the store. There's so many tourists. So we also have to think about in terms of coastal management, making these systems sustainable, not just in the sense of the physical stuff, the water and the, and the food and, the, and the, that kind of stuff, but, but is it sustainable from a human perspective, from a, from a cultural perspective? Are we still going to have all the great operas and the great culture and painting and stuff like that that emanated from Venice if the vast majority of everybody going there is, you know, on a discount flight for the afternoon, right? So those are issues we need to deal with. Uh, ecotourism is, is becoming a larger and larger thing, especially in a lot of our coastal zone areas that used to be um, what we might call working coasts or working harbors that, that were producing timber, producing fish, something of that nature, for various reasons, oftentimes because we've over-harvested those resources or poorly managed those, harvest, uh, those resources, one of the next go-tos is, um, is tourism. So last class we went to uh, Hawaii um, with Cause, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm wearing my Hawaii shirt today in memory of him. Um, but but uh, this is one of the things we checked out. So this is, this is uh, in uh, Kona on the big island. And what you're seeing are a bunch of big giant manta rays. So some of these are three, four feet across. Some of these are much larger. And this is, this is uh, a bunch of divers in the water. These manta rays are filter feeders. So if you look right here, th this is a guy's, this is his butt. He's swimming away from us. So his mouth is here. He has these two... Um, uh, essentially guides to funnel water into his mouth, these palps here, and, uh, and water is going into his mouth and then going over his gills and water is exiting here. So he's both breathing, he's both getting oxygen from the water through those, but also he's filter feeding. So these manta rays are not a threat to you. They don't have teeth like a, a shark or something like that. They're rather eating these little small plankton. And so what folks have figured out is if you go in the water and hang out, and, and take a bright dive light at night, a lot of our phytoplankton are po what's called positively phototactic, mean, meaning when there's light, they swim towards it. That's an adaptation for them to swim towards the moon at night and to go towards the surface and do stuff in the surface, and, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. But suffice to say that they'll swim towards light. And so if you go down and turn a dive light on, um, the manta rays have now figured out, not only are, they, are there more plankton there, but they've also realized now when they hear the sound of the, of the boats that come in the evening time, free meals. So people are essentially lighting up the water and these guys are coming in, swooping on in and feasting on food, right? Uh, food that, that are attracted by the light, not, not, uh, not chummed with you know, cans of tuna or something. And so that's pretty cool. But when you step back and look, there's a gazillion million folks there. So when we were there and we counted the boats around, there was, I 
forget off the top of my head, but there was like 22, 23, but in a very small area, in an area maybe maybe twice the size of Sierra Hall. So, you know, that's a huge, how do we manage that, right? This might be a totally sustainable thing, right? We're not hurting the, the manta rays. We're not, we're not stabbing them or, 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 you know, jumping on their backs and riding them like cowboys, at least you're not supposed to. Um, so, so in theory, this should be a sustainable tourism thing. However, when you have a gazillion million boats all in a small area and everybody's coming from Sichuan province or Des Moines or whatever, and, and they're maybe not bad people, but they just don't know how to behave, right? And they get in the water and then when you have that many people, somebody does something silly or whatever, then people start screaming and then, then all of a sudden somebody's dropping an anchor on somebody's head or something, right? So, so again, managing the people is an is a interesting challenge. But again, one that if we get right, this could be a fantastic, this is a great source of money for folks that have these dive boats. They do one dive. They leave right as the sun's starting to set. People go down, and this is in like 20 feet of water, super close to the harbor. So they, they hardly spend any gas. They go anchor. People go down, have an awesome experience, you know, take photos, all kinds of great memories, come back, and you're back home by 9 o'clock. You're having, you know, if you're the boat owner, you're having dinner by 9. So, so um, potentially a, a great thing if, if, uh, if managed properly. Um, there's still all kinds of awesome stuff in the broader coastal zone. This is off the Yucatan Peninsula. This is underwater. This looks like a picture in a cave. This is underwater. So it looks like there's a, a, a lake or a, a pool of water down there. That's actually a hyperbrine lake, a lake in the ocean on the bottom of the ocean. So there's all kinds of really crazy cool stuff that is still around. And sometimes, because oftentimes I'll be focusing on Oh my God, don't have no fish. Oh my God, Venice is sinking. Right? Sometimes I give you guys the impression that everything is screwed. Everything is not screwed. There's still great stuff that are going on. There's still success stories out there. And we still do live in a, in a magical world. And so it's important to not, not forget that. Even in the coastal zone, even when you have tons of people there and folks are packed in, there's still uh, all kinds of wonderful experiences, both, both natural experiences like this. Oh, I don't know why I put this in here. Um, <laughs> I was gonna tell a story about this. So anyway, so um, this is this is uh, this is not a dead bear. He's just sleeping. He's about to wake up and then chase us. But um, so this is what we would call a grizzly bear, and this is a, one of our projects in in Turkey. But but uh, we just put him to sleep. We put a radio collar on him so we could follow him around and and, and see uh, where his territory was. But we have all kinds of predators in the coastal zone still. In California, we've lost our grizzly bears. We're just in the 1930s. Our last one was shot. Yeah. What is your shirt about? <laughs> uh, it says communists have no class. It was a oh, it, it was saying. a joke. It's a funny shirt. I didn't read it. So many of my shirts I don't wear for you guys because they might have bad words and stuff on them, and I don't want to offend anyone. But um, it, yeah, I, didn't, I forgot I had that shirt on. But um, yeah, I was not trying to disparage communists with this. Thing, I'm just saying. But um, uh, in any event, uh, uh, so but California. You know, we've, we've gone almost a century without this top carnivore. Right. Super key. The reason our mountain lions behave the way they behave is because they evolved with grizzly bears around. So a lot of their behaviors that we interpret as strange are so they can hide from these guys, which would have kicked their butts and eaten them. We're now just starting this year a new pr proposal to work on, it's going to be a long-term thing, to work on reintroduction plans for grizzly bears in, in the western U.S., so that's a long time coming. Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. What would we do with the black bears? What, I'm sorry, what about the black bears? Well, because I know that they're not really from here, but they've kind of taken the role of the grizzly bears. A little bit. What would we do? So, right. So the question is, what about uh, other guys that have gone into some of their ecological roles? So in this case, uh, black bears. So we definitely have black bears in the Cespi, a, a lot of them. Um, and so what would we do with those guys? The grizzly bears would just sort of kick, the, the black bears would leave. Or, or they would leave those immediate areas. It, potentially, potentially all that stuff's on the table. So at this level, um, we're going to talk about what, what is, what would be the advantage of, say, uh, uh, reducing those guys. Um, uh, but, but, so the answer is potentially, probably not, but, but, but maybe. Um, the point being, we can actually reintroduce these predators. And it's not always that, oh my God, the world then stuff sucks, right? It's, hey, this is messed up. Let's, take a positive action to correct this, this, uh, 
this condition that is not ideal, right? And so, uh, so grizzly bears, maybe we'll someday have grizzly bears back in California. Well, we have grizzly bears in California. Maybe one day we'll have grizzly bears in the wild in California again. That would be, that would be, I would personally think that'd be pretty cool. M many people disagree with me, but maybe. Uh, and then lastly, there's all kinds of awesome culture that comes from um, our coastal zone. And so there's, this is an example of Polynesian dance. This is, this is a Hawaiian hula on the left. And then on the right there is my grandma, who also passed away the same day as cause. So she just died two days ago. Thank you. Um, but she was an awesome lady. She was almost 100. She would have been 100 next year. So she grew up in Hawaii. And she has, you know, all kinds of crazy stories about World War II and about working in the planning, uh, in, in the canning plants in a very multicultural society that had folks from Japanese ancestry and Filipinos and Portuguese and all this kind of mixing stuff. So, so these coastal zones really are, because we oftentimes are so attracted to them, and sometimes in our class we'll, we'll maybe overly focus on the downsides of that and how hard it is sometimes to get all these different groups to talk to each other and work, work to each, with each other, and that is a challenge. But there's also really cool things that can come from from uh, when we get those things right, right? Not that we're all perfect and we're all harmonious and we're all cool, but, but all kinds of cool stuff can come from, from living in the coastal zone. So, so we're gonna talk about these things and a lot more this semester. That's just a little bit of a, um, to properly try to set, set the, the right frame of mind for us. Um, I, think, I think what we'll do is we'll take a quick five minute break and then we'll do this exercise because I think I, it's already 45 minutes in.